أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله Allah faham beli tau batau wafir Kulubi fa'innaka ghafiru thambil azim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Zulakallah hai everybody for turning up today to this uh, lecture on the topic of the Qur'an and the return of Isa alayhi salam. So we'll begin without further ado. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. We are blessed to be in the company of Sheikh Imran Hussain. Many of you who are aware of who he is and his credentials. No introduction needed. Um, so, without further ado, I would just like to add before I allow Sheikh to commence his lecture on the topic today that this is the man I have recognized to be closely following the Sunnah of the Prophet. And it's because of this. For me, at least, because of this Shaykh, I have fallen in love with the Qur'an. MashaAllah. May Allah be witness to my testimony today that because of this man, I was very wrong in my life. And because of this man. MashaAllah. Mm. May Allah reward him immensely. So, in his honor, I have penned a poem, an Urdu poem. Um, I will try my best to contain myself, so please forgive me. It's a very emotional moment for me because I have been following this man for a very, very long time. And when I saw him today, I could not contain myself. The tears just automatically came through my heart. So it goes along the lines of Ujjur Gay Meri Basti Yadaniya Yashir. جب اس دل میں قرآن آیا عجیب و غریب خیال و فکر نے کیا مجھے حیران و پریشا در حقیقت تو یہ ہے تب آباد ہوئی میری ویران خستی ساجد جب اس دل میں قرآن آیا یا شیخ ماشاءاللہ آئی انجسٹوڈ پارے پر ماشاءاللہ الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين استقى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them of the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh here in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland, in Britain. And uh, we pray for blessings on our dear uh, Sajid who with great courage and determination in the face of a lot of hostile responses, was able to organize this session today on the subject of uh, the Quran and the return of the Messiah. Why the Quran? Because Allah says in the Quran, Ba'adawuzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. 
وَإِنَّهُ لَحَقُّ الْيَكِينَ That in this book there is absolute truth. Absolute truth is truth which cannot be challenged at all. Absolute truth does not exist anywhere else but the Quran. The Quran is preserved by Allah Ta'ala. It is his word, his Quran. And so when we want to answer the question about the return of the Messiah, it is to the Quran we should turn, first of all. Those who turn elsewhere than the Quran are a people who are following an incorrect methodology. But the sorrowful thing is, no matter how much you try to teach them, they will not learn. What does the Quran have to say about the return of the Messiah, which is the most important event yet remaining to occur? in history. Is there anyone in this room who does not believe that the Messiah will return? So everybody in this room agrees with the prophecy <coughs> that the Messiah will return. Is that correct? Yes. How then do we explain Eminent scholars of Islam, eminent scholars of the Quran, including a Sheikh al Azhar, <laughs> including one of the most famous scholars of contemporary history who gave us a translation and commentary of the Quran in English, Muhammad Asad, including many scholars now alive in the world and who are considered to be scholars of eminence and they all reject. They all reject the belief in the return of Jesus. If these were schoolboys, we could ignore it. But when you have a Sheikh al-Azhar declaring, giving a fatwa, that Jesus is dead and not returning. When you have so many, I have the names I can give you, how many eminent scholars, including those now alive. When they all declare the same thing, Jesus is dead and he's not returning. How do we explain that? I have an explanation. And if you are not satisfied with mine, you must, you must tell me what is your explanation for this amazing phenomenon of so many eminent scholars rejecting belief in the return of Jesus. How do we explain it? I would rather not mention his name but I'm doing so only to wake you up. To wake you up. Let me make it plain and clear. I have the greatest respect and regard and appreciation for the scholarship of Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Oh yes. I regard him to be my teacher, <laughs> although I never met him. But you cannot find in Iqbal evidence of belief in the return of Jesus. Rather, you can find that which suggests that he does not believe in the return of Jesus. Because he was once a member of the Ahmadiyya movement. And the Ahmadiyya movement has done the greatest work of all 
is seeking to destroy belief in the return of Jesus. So although you cannot find in Iqbal that he clearly rejects belief in the return of Jesus, there's a hint of it all away in his scholarship. And certainly not the affirmation in the return of Jesus. Similar with the Imam al-Mahdi. He clearly re rejects the hadith on the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. This is the scholarship of Dr. Iqbal. How can we explain men of such high caliber and scholarship rejecting belief in the return of Jesus? When Allah says in the Quran that he has sent this Quran Tibian and liquid liche that this Quran explains all things. And hence this Quran must explain the return of the Messiah. And if the Quran has explained the return of the Messiah, please come in here, come in. Please come in. See if you can find a seat. If no seat, then we sit on the floor. Yes, we sit on the floor. Yeah. When the <laughs> excuse me, when the Quran says that this Quran explains all things, then this Quran must explain the return of the Messiah. And if the Quran has explained the return of the Messiah, how come these great scholars reject belief in the return of the Messiah? Let us go to the Quran and let us see what is it that prevents them from understanding what Allah has said in the Quran. What is it that is blocking them? And we begin by making a distinction, uh, a little bit of technical analysis now, between two kinds of verses in the Quran. The Quran has verses which are plain and clear, and they're called Ayat Muhkamat. <coughs> and the Quran declares that these verses constitute Ummul Kitab. This is the very heart of the book. So beware, be careful. Don't play around with Ayat Muhkamat. Don't play games with Ayat Muhkamat. Because this is Ummul Kitab. This is the heart of the book. <coughs> The other ayat are ayat mutashabihat. And these are verses which have to be interpreted, ta'weel. But only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. So if you give an interpretation, then the sensible thing to do is to say Allah knows best. Allah knows best. So you don't have a boxing match over Ayat Mutashabinat. You don't call people kafir over Ayat Mutashabinat. You don't divide the Ummah over Ayat Mutashabinat. Because these have a lower status than the Ayat Mutashabinat. And when you have the appearance of a conflict between an ayah, muhkama, and an ayah, mutashabiha, my gosh, what do you do? The Quran is non-contradictory. The whole Quran is harmoniously integrated. Everything is harmonious with each other. So nothing in the Quran could be out of step. <laughs> it is you who is out of step, not the Quran. 
You need to lose some more thinking to be able to discover the harmonious relationship between all the verses of the Quran. Uh, I don't want to go to a Nasik well Mansur because that's only going to complicate the situation even more. This is enough. When we turn to the Quran, there is only one verse of the Quran which declares the return of the Messiah plainly and clearly. I am I am Muhkama. All the rest involves interpretation. What is that verse? It is in Surah to Zuhruf. And the context of the passage concerns Nabi Isa Islam. Jesus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'adawuzi billahi min ash-shaytan yajim wa innahu la'alamun lisa'ah. And surely he is the sign of the last hour. This is an ayah muhkama. Plain and clear. What is there in him which could be a sign of the last hour? When the last prophet has not as yet come. The last kitab has not as yet been revealed. Nothing in his life could constitute a sign of the last hour when the last prophet has not as yet come and the Quran has not yet been revealed. The only way that he can be a sign of the last hour is if he returns to the world. There is no other way you can explain the declaration of the Quran that surely he is the sign of the last hour. There are eminent scholars in the past who said, oh, no, no, it is his virgin birth. His virgin birth is a sign of the last hour. And others who give other kinds of explanations. But the end, <laughs> the final statement is that nothing in his life could possibly qualify as a sign of the last hour when the last prophet has not as yet come. And the last kitab, the Quran, has not has yet been revealed. In fact, it will be 600 years later. And so the only way that he can be a sign of the last hour is if he returns to the world. That is the Quran. So why did, uh, why did the Sheikh Al-Azhar not realize this? That the Quran is stating plainly and clearly that he is a sign of the last hour. What happened to Muhammad Asa? I wish he was alive today. What an eminent scholar he was. I met him once in 1974. There was a conference in London. And I flew from Pakistan to attend the conference. And I, went, I was too scared in the presence of such a learned man. I just went to shook his hand and ran away quickly. How do we explain? When this is so plain and clear. And surely he is a, an alam. Alam means a sign. He is a sign of the last hour, meaning his return is a sign of the last hour. How do we explain that all of these eminent scholars could say he's dead, he's not coming back? 
the answer lies in something I have to share with you. That when Allah sent down the Quran on the heart of Nabi Muhammad there were no tashkil. Tashkil? Fathan, Kesra, and Dhamma. And when he dictated the Quran to the scribes and they recorded it, there were no tashkil, Fathan, Kesra, and Dhamma. And when the early Muslims had that recorded version of the Quran, the early generation, the Aslaq, there was no Fathan, Kesra, and Dhamma, no tashkil in the Quran. So the Tashkil is not a part of the Quran. Is, is there anyone who differs with me? Is there anyone who differs with me? No. It was when non-Arabs became Muslims, like Imran's forefathers, then to help the non-Arab they started putting it in the Tushki that the Arabs did not need. The Fatha and the Kesra and them. So who did it? Was it the angel who came down and did it? Huh? Did Allah instruct someone to come put in the Tushki? Answer me. No. No. It was our brothers, human beings. And we are grateful to them for what they did because it helps us. We are not Arabs. It helps us to recite. It helps me to recite the Quran, the Tashkir, which they have introduced. Is it possible that in that attempt to put in the Tashkir, is it possible that Shaitan could have done some nasty work? Is it possible that Dajjal could have intervened and done some bogus work? Or was this divinely protected? Divinely protected. Was it divinely protected? Where is the proof? Yes. Uh huh? Was it divinely protected? I believe so, yes. Where is the proof? Where does Allah say He's going to protect those human beings who are going to put in the Fatah and Kesra and Dhamma? There is no proof, my, my brother. He said that, as Allah subhanahu wa said that. Uh, he is going to protect the book. He's going to protect the Quran, yes, of course. The Quran is protected. Are the Tashkil a part of the Quran? No. <laughs> you are yourself confirming the Tashkil are not a part of the Quran and therefore not divinely protected. I don't know how you could come to the conclusion that they divinely they're not divinely protected. Now then this solitary verse of the Quran, which is an ayah muhkama, is the foundation of the belief that Jesus will return. Everything else that I will deliver from the Quran is supportive of this. This is pivotally important. Now then, how can you explain that every single copy of the Quran written today that you can pick up says something else. It does not say that he is a sign of the last hour because of difference in Tashkil. What does it say? Every single copy of the Quran, anywhere in the world you choose today, if you find one without it, let me know. <laughs> What does it say? Because of a change in Tashkil, instead of a Fatha, someone put a Kesra. That's all. From on top, they put it up. One small change. Instead of the line on top, they put it below. And now what do we have? Surely he is the knowledge of the last hour. That is what the verse now says. 
And this is every single copy of the Quran. So how could I begin the talk by reciting the Quran and saying to you, Allah says, Wa innahu la'alamun lisa. How could I say that to you when every single copy of the Quran says something else? <laughs> the answer is, if Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, if he had not recited it as alamun lissa, I would not be able to do this. Because there is evidence that he recited it that way. They cannot stop me. They cannot say I'm wrong. Because we have the evidence that Abdullah ibn Abbas recited the Quran this way. And surely he, Jesus, is a sign of the last hour. Now what do we do with this one? And surely he, Jesus, is the knowledge of the last hour. Is this an ayah muhkama or is it an ayah mutashabiha? And surely he is the knowledge of the hour. I don't want you to answer. I'll answer for you. You cannot get away from it. And surely he is the knowledge of the hour is clearly without a shadow of a doubt. It is an ayah mukkama. It's a plain and stick, plain and clear statement. You cannot get away from that. And surely he is the knowledge of the hour. You cannot get away from that. This is an ayah muhkama. And you don't play games with an ayah muhkama. This is the heart of the Quran. This is Ummul Kitab. But we have a problem. The Quran is non contradictory. <laughs> if you say that this is what the Quran is saying, that surely He is, He is the knowledge of the hour then the implication is that the knowledge of the hour is with him. If you say that he is the knowledge of the hour, then the implication is that the knowledge of the hour is with him. If you say, let me repeat it one more time. If you say that he is the knowledge of the hour, then the implication is that the knowledge of the hour is with him. Otherwise, we should all go back to school. We don't have any sense in our head. We can't think. Well, how could the knowledge of the hour be with him? When Allah says time and again in the Quran that the knowledge of the hour is only with Allah. So if you say he is the knowledge of the hour, you're in conflict with other verses of the Quran. So what do they do? They now act recklessly foolish people to use the gentlest word that I can use foolish people do things that angels fear to do to take an ayah mukkama and now transform it into an ayah mutashabih this is Ummul Kitab <laughs> and they say when Allah says that he is the knowledge of the hour. <laughs> what Allah means by that is that he is the sign of the last hour. In order to get away from the contradiction. So in order to get out of the contradiction that the Quran is saying that the knowledge of the hour is with Jesus. And the Quran is saying that the knowledge of the hour is only with Allah. It's a contradiction. To get out of this contradiction, they resort now to transforming an ayah muhkama 
than Dronaya Mutasha. That is recklessness. That is inexcusable. This is Omar Kitab. This is the heart of the Quran. You don't play games with this. And that's what they're doing. And when I say no, this is wrong, you say I'm a kafir. <laughs> that's, that's the latest thing that is now trending. Imran Hussein is a kafir. Because Imran Hussein says there's a mistake in the Quran. I have never said that there's a mistake in the Quran. Because the tash tashkila not a part of the Quran. Now we can understand why an eminent scholar like Muhammad Assad could make this mistake and declare that Jesus is dead and not returning. If you read his commentary of the Quran, Muhammad Assad, you see that in order to get out of this predicament, because he is accepting the wording that he or it is the knowledge of the hour. And to get out of this, he said, can't be Jesus. The pronoun does not refer to Jesus. He said the pronoun refers to the Quran. That this Quran, the revelation of this Quran, this is a sign of the last hour. That's how Muhammad Assad gets out of the predicament. But the problem is that the context is clearly Jesus. The ayah before this. The all the ayah before, all on Jesus, yes. Okay. All on Jesus. So the context is Jesus. In respect of the other eminent scholars like Sheikh Shaltut, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, Sheikh Ra Rashid Rida, and many others, and including scholars who are alive today whose names I will not mention. It seems to me that they have all accepted this bogus tashkil. And as a consequence, they were misguided from what the Quran is really saying, that he is the sign of the last hour. That's what the Quran was saying. And they got it wrong. They say, no, this is, and he is the knowledge of the last hour. And that's not possible because the knowledge of the last hour is only with Allah. So they were misguided by this error in the Tashkil. Does that mean that I'm saying that there's a mistake in the Quran? No. Is it possible for anyone who has two rupees worth, you know, a rupee used to worth, we worth something long time, Pakistani rupee. One dollar was worth one rupee seventy-five pesos when I was a student. Two rupees today means nothing. You can't even buy a cup of tea with it. <laughs> Is there anyone who still holds the view that I am declaring that there's a mistake in the Quran? No. No, it's clear. It's clear. And so here is a major part of the explanation. Why is it that so eminent scholars of Islam in the world, in the past and to this day, have rejected the view that Jesus will return? If this explanation which I have given that this tashkil is wrong reaches those who are still alive, we pray that they may change their view and recognize that what the Quran has said is that surely he, Jesus, is the sign of the last day. And that other tashkil is bogus and false. Now then, I can only <laughs> offer you one more proof from the Quran, unless you want to go until tomorrow morning. And we have to perform Salatul Maghrib. What time is Salatul Maghrib? 9.30? Those of you who have not performed your Salatul Ash, you should go and perform and come back. I already performed my Salatul Ash. So we stop at Maghrib? Yeah. Right, okay. The next one is the crucifixion. Allah says 
if you and I were there, we would be convinced he was crucified. Yes, every single one of us would be convinced that he was crucified. So if the Christians and the Jews are convinced he was crucified, do you blame them? Can you blame them? Nothing, no one in the whole world ever contested the view that he was crucified. No one. Until the Quran was revealed. 600 years later. So the only voice in the world contesting the view that he was crucified is the voice of the Lord God in the Quran. What does the Quran say? We go to Surah to Nisa. And he says, him," And they were boasting. Inna katalna al-Masiha Isa ibn Maryam al-Rasulullah. We have killed him. The Messiah. Jesus. The son of Mary. The messenger of Allah. So this is <coughs> sarcasm because they rejected him. And they're boasting. They saw him crucified. They wanted him crucified because the Torah says whosoever dies like that is the cursed of the Lord God. But he is claiming to be the Messiah. So if we can get him to be crucified, it will be clear and plain to everybody he can't be the Messiah because he is dead. And look at how he died. The Messiah is supposed to rule the world from holy Israel. He never did that. So it's plain and clear he could not have been the Messiah. But then Allah says, No, number one, they did not kill him. This is ayah muhkama. This is a statement which is plain and clear. Don't try to play rings around it. Plain and clear, they did not kill him. Number two, Wama Salabuhu, they did not crucify him. This is a plain and clear statement. Ayah Mukkama. Number three, Walakin Shubbihalahum. What does it mean? Walakin Shubbihalahum. For those who don't let the imaginations go running all around the place. Well, that can should be happening. Allah made it appear like that. That's all the verse is saying. Allah made it appear that he was crucified. That's all. Well, that can should be happening. So if I was there, I would be convinced that he was crucified. Well then, how did Allah make it appear that he was crucified? It is to the Quran we must turn for guidance, not the Hadith. When we go to the Quran and then the Hadith is in harmony with the Quran, no problem. But if we go to the Quran and then the Hadith is in conflict with the Quran, what do you do? So proper methodology is how did Allah make it appear to them that he was crucified when he was not? Proper methodology is to answer that question, seek the answer in the Quran, not the Hadith. Is there anything in the Quran saying <laughs> that Allah caused someone to assume the appearance of Jesus and that innocent man innocent because he never claimed to be the Messiah Innocent because he never claimed to be the Messiah. 
Shall I repeat it one more time? That innocent man was crucified because Allah caused him to assume the appearance of Jesus. Whoever let their imagination run with this nonsense or assume that a hadith can support it and, and contradict the Quran, I, I pity you on Judgment Day because you are attributing an act of injustice to Allah. It is an act of injustice that Allah should cause an innocent man to assume the appearance of Jesus. And that innocent man is now crucified in place of Jesus. That is an act of injustice. So I pity them on Judgment Day. What? is the explanation that Allah has given. How did he make it appear that he was crucified? That's the question. Does the Quran answer that? Yes, it does. But before we offer the explanation in the Quran, I must explain to you that death mouth is like divorce. If a husband says to his wife, I hereby make talaq on you. What is the implication? The implication is that he has simply commenced a process. That's all. Divorce is not as yet taken place. It is after the process has completed with the edda of three monthly courses if he has not revoked the pronouncement, only now does a divorce enter into force. So a pronouncement of divorce simply initiates a process. That's all. When Allah takes the soul, it's the same thing. If he takes your soul, you're not yet dead. <laughs> When he takes the soul, he initiates a process. Because after taking the soul, he can do one of two things. He can either keep the soul, in which case you're dead, or, or he can return the soul for a specific period of time in which case you did not die. So taking the soul is like pronouncing divorce. So now let's go to Surah to Ali Imran. When I'm finished with this, I'll stop the lecture, otherwise we go on for another three hours. This is Surah to Ali Imran. And it is the time of the crucifixion. And Nabi Isa does not know what's going to happen. And Allah speaks to him. Imagine the Christians in Armenia when I go there next month. And the Christians in Greece. And when I sit with them and I start to tell them, look, this is in the Quran. And nobody ever told them. The Ottoman Empire ruled over them for centuries without ever telling them what is in the Quran. And they're hearing it for the first time. <laughs> Listen, it's going to be very interesting when I reach to Armenia and I manage to reach to Greece. May Allah make it possible for me to reach there, inshallah. Ya Isa, here's the conversation recorded in the Quran. Oh Jesus, inni mutawafika. I am going to take your soul. This is Wafat. I am going to take your soul and this is what initiates the process of death. Where is the proof of this? Inni mutawafiq. The proof of this is in Surah to Zumar. Listen to what Allah says. Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha. When the time of death comes, Allah takes the soul. 
The nafs is the soul. The ruh is the spirit. The jism is the body. So he takes the nafs at the time of death, the self. Self and soul mean the same thing. So at the time of death, Allah takes the self or the nafs. Which surah is this? Hmm? Zumar. Wallati lam tamud, but there are those who most certainly, most certainly did not die. Although he took their soul, they most certainly did not die. Shimanamiha, for example, he takes their soul while they are asleep, for example. For Yum Shikulati Kala Ali al Maut, he then keeps those for whom Maut is written, death. Wa Yur Silul Ukra Ila Ajalin Musamma. And the other souls he send them back. So in Nimuta Rafika means I am going to take your soul or your nafs or yourself. Warafiyuka ilayya, and I'm going to raise you unto myself. Now you have to think. And I hope this audience in Edinburgh doesn't disappoint me. Because this city is famous for eminent, eminent, eminent thinkers and scholars. It's the city of Arnold Toynbee. Arnold Toynbee wrote Civilization on Trial. You had to have some amount of truth in your heart to be able to write that book. Yes, Arnold Toynbee. I don't think he was completely secularized. He had some faith in his heart. Arnold Toynbee. So I hope Edinburgh will not disappoint me. I am in Britain to try to get you to think. That's all. And they call me a Kafir. <laughs> it's so silly. I'm going to take your soul. And I'm going to raise you unto myself. And I'm going to cleanse you of all that they have hurled against you. That's Kufr. So if Allah took his soul, And then Allah raised him. What happened in between? If Allah takes a soul, then the process commences. And there are only two possibilities. Either he keeps the soul, in which case you died, or he returns the soul, in which case you did not die. So what happened when Allah took his soul? Can anyone help me? Not dead, not alive. Who is it? Hmm. Yes. He's in between, not dead, not alive. What did he say? He says he's in between, not dead and not alive. No, no, no. When Allah <coughs> takes the soul, they only Two possibilities. This is what surah? Zumar. Yeah. Only two possibilities, not three or four. For yum sikulati kada alayhi al maut. He can either keep the soul for those for whom death is written. Wa yursilul ukhra ila ajalin musamma. And for those for whom death is not written, he returns the soul for an appointed period of time. Really two possibilities. So will someone answer me. Allah took his soul. Then what happened? He he returned. Returned. That's right. That's right. Edinburgh has not disappointed me. There are many parts of Britain who will be scared to do what you've just done. 
because they've lost the capacity to think. The brainwashing has been total and complete. And it's difficult for them to get out of that brainwashing. So Allah took his soul and the Quran is telling you that there was only two possibilities when Allah took his soul, either to keep it or return it. And he did not keep it, so the only possibility is he returned it. And then he raised him unto himself. And so he never experienced mouth. He never experienced mouth. But Allah says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin za'ikatul mawt. Every soul, including Nabi Isa al-Islam, must taste mawt. Since he never experienced mawt, and he has to experience mawt, the implication is he has to return to this world and experience mawt. I have given you Two proofs from the Quran. There is a third one when uh, they boasted of how they killed him. Then Allah says about it, none of them will escape. None of them will escape. وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ But you will have to believe in him as the Messiah before he dies. قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ قَبْلَ means before. قَبْلَ doesn't mean هِنَا هِنَا مَوْتِهِ at the time of his death. قَبْلَ means before his death. You wouldn't understand why I'm making this, but if you read my book on the Messiah, the Quran, and Akhir Rahman, you'll understand why I'm doing this. What are the different explanations people get? So none of them will escape, but they'll have to declare the faith in him as the Messiah, whether they like it or not, when he returns and before he dies. This is another proof. And then there is, uh, <coughs> when the angel came to Maryam, and said to her, alayhi salam, you're going to have a baby boy. The angel went on to inform her, the baby boy is going to be the Messiah. The angel went on to say about this Messiah, the baby, yukallimun nasa fil mahdi wa kahlan. That this baby will speak miraculously from the cradle, and as an adult. And the baby did speak miraculously from the cradle. But how is it miraculous for an adult to speak? It's normal and natural. The only way an adult could speak miraculously is if he comes back. That's a miracle. And then finally the Quran says, the, the angel said to Maryam that Allah will teach him the kitab and Allah will bestow hikmah on him, wisdom. And Allah will teach him the Torah and the Gospel. Well, you alim muhul kitaba wal hikmah, wal Torah wal injil. And you just have to do a little bit of homework to understand kitab is the Quran. So why would Allah teach him the Quran? The Quran is not to be revealed for 600 years. So why is Allah teaching him the Quran? There's only one answer. Because he's coming back. And when he comes back, he has to deal with the Ummah of Muhammad in addition to his Ummah. So he's taught the Torah and the Gospel as well. And he has to be the supreme guide and lawgiver for both these Ummahs and that requires his wisdom. And so I've given you five proofs from the Quran. But I've gone through the last three very, very quickly. But you'll get a complete prof uh, uh, um, analysis in my book, um, The Messiah, the Quran, and Akhir Zaman. So let us end now, and we still have a few minutes before Maghrib. Yes. Any questions? Uh, sure. We can play Maghrib here. We still have another one hour. Oh. I want to continue after.
Okay, so we're going out from Agrebo? Yeah, we're going out from Agrebo, okay. Yeah. Just spend that. Close the door, please. Yeah. All right, we'll have half an hour more, and then you'll allow me. Um, uh, the books will probably be outside there. And I will go and sit out there, so for autographing it'll be easier. And after the autographing, I'll just leave. Uh, question and answers is no. When I'm sitting out there, autographing books, please don't come and ask questions at that time, okay? <laughs> I want to concentrate on autographing the books. That's not the time to come to start a conversation with me to ask questions. So please don't do that. I believe you can now understand why so many scholars of Islam went on the wrong path, if distinguished scholars of Islam, on the wrong path on this subject. Number one, they were misguided by the bogus tashkil. So they said the Quran is not saying that he is a sign of the last hour when the Quran is saying that. Number two, when Allah said, I'll make it appear unto them that he was crucified when he was not. They fell for that bogus nonsense, which is sinful nonsense, that Allah caused someone to take on the appearance of Jesus. And he was crucified, not Jesus. So they said, when he died a natural death, and the Ahmadiyya movement said they went to Kashmir and he died, and his grave is over there. And when Allah says, I took his soul, in Nimut they did not translate it honestly and truthfully. The verse is saying, I will take your soul or your nafs, yourself. But they translated it, I'm going to take you, <laughs> which is a wrong translation. I will take you. So there are a number of mistakes that they committed along the way. I don't have the time to share with you all the mistakes. But it was a comedy of mistakes on this subject, which combined to cause so many eminent scholars of Islam to come to the wrong conclusion that Nabi Isa al-Islam is dead and he's not coming back. No one in this room believes that. None of you. We all believe that no, he did not die. Allah raised him and he's coming back. This is our belief. So I have shared with you some of the problems connected with the subject. Uh, but if you read my book, which this is the latest book, you would not find it in this catalog because there are some books which are written after this catalog. This catalog is about five years old. The title of the book is The Messiah, The Quran, and Akhir was Zaman. That book is outside. Yes, though. No. Question and answer. If you write your answer, that'd be helpful for me. If you write your question, yeah. Is it a misunderstanding or a misconception that Islam will rule for five years in the end times when we know that the final rule will be the Jesus? Uh, when you say Islam will rule, I assume that what you are saying is that the Ummah of Muhammad Islam will rule. Is that what you mean by Islam will rule? <laughs> as in, as in uh, uh, ruling, ruling the world as we used to. So let us put it this way. Don't say Islam will rule. Will the Ummah of Muhammad Islam rule the world in the end time? What does the Quran say? Anybody? Anybody? 
<laughs> Let Dr. Jadir answer this question. Go ahead. Sheikh uh, gave you the first part of the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having a direct conversation with Isa al Islam in the first tense. I will take your soul, I will raise you to myself, I will cleanse you of the filth and the kufr they put upon you. And then the next part is those who stayed faithful to you, I will raise them, meaning in power, above those who do kufr and shirk. And when I do so, they will remain in that position of power until Yawm al Qiyamah. So a people who are faithful to Isa Islam will have power in this dunya. When they get that power, they will remain in that position of power until the end of the world. They will rule the world. Which and surah? Sh- Which surah? Surah Ali Imran. And Sheikh has identified those people. We have an obsession with rule the Muslims. But our job is not to rule. We are the Ummah of Al Firdaus. And if you want Al Firdaus, be prepared not to rule, but to be ruled. That's my opinion. So while <coughs> Jesus will rule the world as the Messiah, and he will have his Ummah with him and the Khilafah state in Jerusalem. Don't forget that we will have Imam al-Mahdi and we will have a Khilafah state in Mecca. But this will not be the ruling state. That will be the ruling state. But these two states will be in such fraternity and alliance with each other. Like Russia and China today are in friendship and alliance. Huh? So between them, these two states will be in love and friendship and alliance. The Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam and the Ummah of Muhammad Islam. Next question. Yes, sir. What would happen if Muhammad Isa Islam will rule the world? What will happen when the earth ends? Well, we don't know when the earth will end, but uh, after Nabi Isa Islam returns and after he dies, then we don't know how long a period of time will pass until the earth will will be finished. There will be a transformation of this material universe into something which is different. That is my answer. We're too difficult for you. <laughs> Next question. Yes. yes? Uh, why will Muslims rule Constantinople? Why will Muslims rule Constantinople? <clears throat> I have a book entitled Constantinople in the Quran and I'm lecturing on that subject tomorrow night in Inverness. How many hours is it from here? Three hours. Only three hours? Only? You can make a drive. You can drive. Only, only three hours. Okay. We will conquer Constantinople because Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied it. That's why. Right. He said, you will most certainly conquer Constantinople. And he praised the army and he praised the commander. This conquest of Constantinople will take place after the Great War. So it is an event which has not as yet occurred. Why will we conquer Constantinople? The Hadith does not answer us. We have to think. And when I offer 
my view, I always warn you. Don't take my view unless you're convinced that I'm correct. I'm not in the, I'm not in the process of brainwashing people. No. I, I like to have thinker, thinkers around me, people who think critically. Because that's what my teacher trained me to do, to think critically. So I'm not the product of your normal Darul Room education at all. I have suggested two reasons why we conquer Constantinople. As soon as we conquer Constantinople, the flag of Islam will be rising in the sky. After so many centuries of dormancy, for so many centuries we were dormant and modern Western civilization were, has subjected us. But with the conquest of Constantinople, the flag of Islam is now rising in the sky. Good? It's a sign. But when conquest of Constantinople take place, the Bosphorus will be free and the Russian Navy will be able to pass through the Bosphorus to go to the Mediterranean. At this time, you can't do that. And that's bad news for Israel. But number two, when we conquer Constantinople, we return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. <coughs> and when we do that, the friendship and alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians will be established to complement the friendship and alliance between Russia and China. These two alliances will take the world to the end time when Israel will face the consequences of her oppression. Next question. <coughs> yes. Do you know what the Buddha was saying about um, Muslims ruling to the end of time? I thought towards the end there was going to be bad, only bad people left and Allah SWT is going to remove the words out of the Quran. So where does that fit in? The beast is supposed to come, come up then as well. She and said, I thought that only bad people are left. Yeah, she said that towards the end of time there will be only bad people left. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the words of the Qur'an. Uh, eschatology, the branch of knowledge I'm pioneering, is mainly concerned with the end of history, when truth will triumph of a falsehood. And peace and justice will triumph over oppression. That's what we are concerned with. After the death of Nabi Isa Islam, what remains is not so important for us. I prefer others answer those questions. I prefer that others deal with that subject. Let me deal with this subject, eschatology. Nobody else is doing it. <laughs> right? So what happens after Jesus dies? Let other scholars deal with that subject. Please, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, can I ask another one? Do you know when he, um, um, the Sheikh was saying about you know, that that, shit, that other Sheikh that was pronouncing the ayat mm -hmm. with the Dhamma instead of the Kasna? Yeah. What made him, how did he get hold of that knowledge to pronounce it in that way when everybody else was doing it in the other way? Do you have to explain that one? The Sheikh has already answered the question that if you assume that Isa Islam is knowledge of the hour, then you are in direct conflict with many other ayat al muhkamat in the Quran. So it cannot be the fact that he is knowledge of the hour. It can only be that he is a sign of the hour. If you accept that he, Isa Islam, is knowledge of the hour, then you have created, you have created the contradiction in the Quran. No, no. And I, I thought, I, I, I thought, I think the sister's asking, I thought, I thought I had explained the subject with simplicity and clarity. I really thought I had done it. He was a companion of the Oh, right, because I didn't, because I didn't know more. I am disappointed. I'm disappointed 
because I thought that I had explained the subject with simplicity and clarity. I am really disappointed that I should now have to repeat. I don't have anything new to say. I simply have to repeat what I've already said. If that is not sufficient for someone to understand clearly, what more can I do? <laughs> what more can I do? All right? What I would suggest to the sister is listen to the recording of the lecture. Sheikh, when, I understand it all. I, I was on about Sheikh, that, that Abbas, the Abbas, the companion. She said know she didn't know that. who Abdullah ibn Abbas was. She thought it was some scholar. I said it was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Oh, but I said it. Abdullah ibn Abbas is there in the recording. But you didn't hear it. Okay, you didn't, didn't hear it. didn't know who that was. Yeah, it's, it's there in the recording, yeah. I I knew that this is a subject that will have to be taught with simplicity and clarity. And I kept on asking in between, does anyone differ with me? Does anyone differ with me? Because I knew that my audience could perhaps have difficulties with the subject. Okay? But uh, I would suggest perhaps, if you still have any doubts, just listen to the lecture, the recording, rather than me having to repeat it again. Any other questions? Yes. Sheikh, um, in many of your previous lectures, so it's a little bit off the topic, apologies. Um, you've, you've been a little bit reluctant in saying what phase we're in. But where things are going now and how fast things are, are moving, towards the end. Would you not say that we're now in phase three? Can you define phase three? Phase three is um, uh, where Fine. Israel becomes the ruling state in the world. Really, it already is quite long. The brother is asking that you have not identified exactly where we are in the timeline of Akhir zaman Correct. Today, are you prepared to say that we are at the cusp of Israel ruling the world? Where have you been these last 25 years? <laughs> Where? Listening to your lectures. Uh -huh. I have said it several times. I cannot understand how it escaped you. The, the reason why they are lusting for the Great War those who control power in the West. It's because Israel cannot replace the United States with the Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana without the Great War. Mm -hmm. Did you not hear me say this? Yes. Right, so. They want the Great War, they hope that both sides will be destroyed. Our eschatology says, no, Allah is going to help Russia. But they don't believe that. After the Great War, I said it again and again. After the Great War, Israel will begin her process of trying to, to uh, claim to be the ruling state in the world. And... Uh, Israel will claim to have military supremacy in the world. Number two, there will be no United Nations organization after that. It's gone. So a new international order to emerge after the Great War in which Israel will seek to rule the world. What are the contours of that international order? I don't know, but I know about this one I spoke about last night in, um, in Glasgow. But I do know that Israel will have to rule the world with money. This will be the master plan, money. And it will be one currency for all of mankind. You heard me say this, didn't you? Yeah. Right. So how far are we, from, are we from this? I have said to you, 
I don't know when the Great War will take place. And I don't want to know. <laughs> but I know it's going to be soon. Don't ask me how soon. I can't answer that. But if Poland were to intervene in Ukraine, it could cause a succession of events taking place that will escalate the war to a possible nuclear war. And Russia has been warning about that again and again. I can do no more than this, than to say to you that after the Great War, within seven years, we have the conquest of Constantinople. I can do no more than this. This is the limits of Islamic eschatology. I am pioneering the subject. No one can do more than this, than what I am doing. After the conquest of Constantinople, then you have the Khuruj of Dajjal, which means a day like a week would have come to an end. So this is the best I can do to answer you. Oh.